So, if you've been following Pine Creek Doug of late, you know, I gotta say hallelujah. What on earth happened? Doug, what are you doing? You did it, Doug. <laughs> Not only did he have one really honest, good conversation with the theist, he had two. He had two in the past, what, two weeks? So, I don't know if any of you are followers of Pine Creek Doug. I watch a good portion of his videos. I'd say I watch about half of everything he puts out. Um, I usually start, it, they always appear on my notifications, so I usually start his, whatever he's doing, and I watch some of it, and then if I get pulled away, sometimes I don't go back to it, and, you know, he puts out a lot of content, so I don't watch it all. But, one of my critiques of Doug, um, if, if you've been following the saga between Doug and myself, I put out two videos recently where I was very, very critical of Doug. The first video, I was a lot more critical, um... And one of the critiques that I said is that I've been watching his show, his channel for two and a half years. I've never seen one honest conversation with the Christian, not one. And I meant that. And lo and behold, now I'm not saying he heard that criticism and took it to heart. Do I think that's what happened? No, I, I mean, I'd like to believe that, but I doubt that's what happened. But something happened because that criticism is no longer valid. Because, and now, I made that criticism about a month ago, and again, I'm not saying that I had anything to do with it, but in the last month, not only has he had one really honest, good conversation with the Christian, he's had two. So, go figure. Well, the other guy's not a Christian. So he had one with this guy called Liev Williams, who was a, uh, calls himself as a cultural Jew, and the one most recent one was a really good, actually in-depth, honest conversation with, I think his name is Stuart... I'm not exactly clear who's who. There's, there's Ask Cliff, and I guess Cliff is, is the father, and I think the guy's name is Stuart is the son. It's the son. I'm not sure if his name is Stuart, or for some reason I have it in my mind that his name is Rob. So I, it's the son of Ask Cliff. And he had him on the show for a while. Now, I didn't finish that conversation yet, but I watched about an hour and 15 minutes or so, or an hour or so, and it's a really good, really solid, really honest conversation. Like, what on earth is going on? Doug! What is going on? That's how you do it, Doug. That's how you interact with people who do not share your beliefs. You ask them honest questions, and you let them give you honest answers, and then you get somewhere real. Now, even if your agenda remains the same, Doug, if, you're, if you, your sole purpose of having a channel and your sole purpose of being out here in this space is to deconvert you know, we hapless Christians is to, is, to, is to deconvert as many hapless Christians as you can, is to teach our dust poor suckers what's what and show us the truth that there isn't no God. Even if that is your sole agenda, and it remains so from now until the day you die, okay, you're going to be far better served by having honest conversations like the two you just had. Why? Because you're going to gain insights. You're going to gain insights to people that you couldn't gain any other way. When people tell you why they believe in God, you probably already understand this, isn't really why they believe in God. When people tell you what's important to them about their religion, it's usually not what's really important to them and why they are religious. Now, you've done a lot of speculating. One of, I guess the one speculation is we all have girlfriends who led us to the Lord. Now, my particular case, my girlfriend just got me in the church. She's now my wife. Um, if she, you know, she, she tries to lead me to a lot of stuff, Doug. So that's not actually a real answer in my case. You know, she got me to the church and I had a really powerful, really to me real religious experience or I never would have stayed. Would have been like, she tries to, you know, she tries to lead me to right wing this and that all the time. Oh, you got to watch the new right wing this and that guy. He's so great. And, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, put it on. Put it on, uh, put it on watch later and we'll get to it tonight and then try and like, so try and like, you know, come up with other things to do. So I never, she does stuff like that to me all the time. And Christianity could have easily been in the category of things she tries to push on me, which is, there are many. <laughs> There's a lot of things my wife tries to push on me. Most of them don't take. The reason why Christianity took has nothing to do with her. Yes, yeah, she got me in the door, but she's not the reason why I stayed. I stayed for the reasons that, or some of the reasons I said. But there may be reasons that I'm a Christian that you could only get at or know. Put it this way, Doug. If you think Christianity is truly a delusion and we are harming ourselves by believing this delusion, okay, if all psychological delusions, all things that people participate in, there's usually a really, really, really strong root cause why. 
and it's never what people are actually saying. So let's take your flying man concoction. It's another one of your elaborate Doug concoctions. Okay, your flying man is only valid. I mean, first of all, the flying man isn't quite valid. It's not properly analogous. But putting that aside for the time being, and let's just say it was a it was a really good concoction. It's a fairly elaborate gotcha concoction. Okay, the flying man is only valid if you are talking to somebody and you say, "Why are you a Christian?" That person says, "I am a Christian." Because I really think the evidence for the resurrection is so strong, and I honestly believe in the resurrection based on, you know, the historical stuff in the doc. If they say that, then yeah, take out your flying man concoction and go, aha, gotcha, <laughs> okay, watch me, gotcha, and then gotcha them. But if they don't say that, you're spinning your wheels and wasting your time. Why? Because it's irrelevant to why they're actually a Christian. And furthermore, you can even be more nuanced about this and ask somebody why they're a Christian. They may give you that song and dance of an answer. But if you have an honest conversation with someone, you may find out that that's just, that's just a fake answer. It's not the real reason they're a Christian. I bet you find that 99 times out of 100, that's not the real reason. So if you want to put this in context of flying man, one of the real things that happened to me in my real life and how instrumental this is to me in being a Christian, I'm not sure, but it's important. Put this in the, in the analogy of the flying man. Okay, once when I was in Italy, and this really happened, I was on a trip to Italy when I was like 22, 23 years old. This particular time in my, wife, my life, I was starting to get a little bit out of control with drugs and alcohol. I was still relatively stable, sort of, but I was heading for trouble. And I, on that trip with me to Italy was a family member of mine, a cousin of mine, Janine, who was a devout Catholic. Now, I didn't know she was a devout Catholic at the time. I had no idea. And we started bonding a lot on that trip, and I had a lot of respect for her. She's a really open-minded, smart, philosophical person, and I, I related to her. We hit it off right off the bat. I hadn't seen her in like 10 years. She's my cousin on my Italian side. Now, one time in that trip, 2 o'clock in the morning, when we were having Italian wine, having a long conversation, I find out that she believes in the flying man. Okay? She tells me, it's, you know, late at night, I'm a devout Catholic. Now, I had a reaction that would have been akin to a skeptic. I was like, pfft. You are? How can you believe that gobbledygook? Isn't that ridiculous? So I say to her, how can you believe in the flying man? And she starts giving me an answers, and we get into a little mini debate, but what she actually said to me about the flying man was totally irrelevant. While I'm sitting with her having this conversation with someone who I deeply respect. Now this is a true story. This really happened, and how instrumental this was in me becoming a Christian, I don't know. But I remembered it deeply at the time, and it influenced me a lot. So it would be akin to me saying, you really honestly believe in the flying man? They started telling me about the flying man. And I'm not necessarily sure that they were giving me the right answers, but there was something about the experience with her. Where I was like, this is a really intelligent person. And as I was talking to her, I started really honestly feeling, you know what? There's, there's got to be truth in this. There's real power here. There's something real about this. I don't know what it is, but I need to check this out. That's what I remember thinking at the time. I went through all the standard, like, you know, you guys are anti-gay. I went through a lot of the standard Christian, you know, the atheist talking points, actually. But then I started putting them aside, started having a real conversation with her. And I decided somewhere internally, emotionally, there's something about this that's real. There's something about this that has real power. There's something about this. And I may have even said there's something about this I want. Now, that's the real nub of it. There's something about this that I want. Now, in my case, you know, you pointed this out a little. I found, when I went to the first time I went to the doorstep of the church, I found what I was looking for, and that, more than anything else, was peace of mind. Honestly. Can you give me sanctuary? I must find a place to hide, a place for me to hide. Can you find me soft asylum? I can't make it anymore. The man is at the door. That's exactly how I felt. That song I used to listen to all the time from the doors. And that's exactly how I felt at that time in my life. That's why that song spoke to me so much, because that's where I was at. And when I went first started the church, and what I first experienced with my cousin was there's something that there is a power to this that is real. There is some something to this. 
There was something about the way she approached life that I wanted to have. And it had something to do with stability, peace of mind, you know, maybe rigid answers to questions, black and white thinking. Maybe I even wanted some of that. Because she had some of that too. Not, not much. Not as much as most of your believing Christians. But there was something about my experience of her that actually got inside of me in a, in a meaningful way. Now that's just one. So that would be akin to, I said, you really honestly believe in the flying man? That's ridiculous. And she started giving me answers about the flying man. And I'm not necessarily sure it was the, it was the substance of the answers themselves. You see what I'm saying? There's something more going on here, Doug. And if you want to actually deconvert us and be useful, it would be in your best interest to put your sword down and have real in-depth conversations with people because that's the only way you're ever going to figure out what the hook actually is. It isn't the resurrection. Let me just clue you in right now. It isn't. I don't care what most people say. It's not that. Yeah, it's something Christians debate all the time. But that's not what's getting people in a church. It's not why people become Christians later in life. It's not why they go to church to begin with. It's not like they wake up and go, you know, the resurrection really makes a lot of sense to me. And it isn't Old Testament either. You know, there are real meaningful things going on when people are... And if you want to help someone like poor Cliff you know, get rid of his Jesus mind virus, the first step for you actually being of service to him is having a real and honest conversation with him that gets somewhere. So you figure out what's actually going on. Now, it, 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 the, the thing, the, the weird anomaly of atheism is that there were not atheists when I was in college. There was no such thing as like, you know, an atheist group on campus. When I went to college, it was the late 80s, early 90s. And if there were, I'd know a lot more about atheists than now, because I would have understood, there would have been a time where I went to a party of all atheists, I would have hung out till a certain atheist till three in the morning. That's when you really get to know people, when you drop their guard. The problem with your approach isn't just that it's disingenuous. Now, you've had two honest conversations. You have probably learned more in those two honest conversations about religious people than you have in all the other ones where you're trying to debunk, dismiss, discredit everybody. That's the real problem for you. You don't learn anything about the opponent. You don't learn anything. The conversation that I have with people with, with atheists, you know, I learned a lot. And what I was trying to point out is if this were, if there were such a thing as atheists on campus back in the day, I would know a lot more about atheists than I know. Why? Because I would have gone to their parties, hung out with, you know, I would try to hit on the great atheist girl. Hey, yeah, you know, we got any evidence? That's exactly what I said to him. You see that bad Yeah, that was great. You know, what's a nice, good, nice agent like you did a place like I would have been hit on her all night. But I would have hung out with like Aaron Ra till like three in the morning, picked his brain, figured out what's actually making him tick. Because what people tell you is making him tick is usually not the real agenda. Matter of fact, it's usually it's usually irrelevant. And I'm pretty sure you know that better than most people. So if you're wasting time trying to debunk, dismiss, discredit any one given, like, middle-hanging fruit guy, you're kind of spinning your wheels and wasting your time. If you really want to help Christians get, get this religious mumbo-jumbo out of our spirit, you've got to figure out what's really motivating us down deep. And the only way you can figure that out is honest conversations. Honestly, it's the only way. It's the only way. It is, it is more in service of your agenda than you think. If you're, uh, you know, maybe you maybe you change, maybe he's totally changed gears. Maybe, you know, he had a, I mean, the conversation with the other guy, who was it, Williams is his name, the cultural Jewish guy. That guy is about where I would expect, that's how I expected most of these conversations with atheists to be. That's how I expected almost all of them to, to go like. I didn't, I wasn't expecting atheists to like put on this tribal, this tribal loyalist routine and try to debunk and dismiss and discredit every word that came out of my mouth. I really wasn't. That threw me when it first started happening. I get it now because I've been doing this for four years, but the first time that happened, I was like, what on earth is wrong with this guy? Why does he want me to be wrong so badly? Why does he have such an agenda here? And why does he have such a committed emotional dog in the fight? And if you're an atheist, it's a God's honest truth. You shouldn't have one. You should be steel man in Christian positions. You should be doing it easily. Why? Because if we're right, you should want to know. And if there's any truth in what we believe, any truth, you should want to know that. You should be in the service of trying to figure out what's true. And some of what we believe is true. Now, maybe you're not willing to believe the ontology, sure. But if you go watch that interview with Pine Creek Doug and Leah Williams, 
where that guy is at is where I would expect most atheists to be at. That, that guy has as little evidence as most of you talk about. And he talks about little evidence. But he's also approached the whole God thing differently. He's not defensive about it. He doesn't have his walls up. He doesn't not want there to be a God. Which is really important, ultimately. There's emotional resistance in a huge chunk of you. And if you don't believe me, go watch your, your debate. Go watch. Go watch half of you on Twitter interact if you don't believe me. It's very rare that you see straightforward, honest conversations with atheists. Now, I can safely say that you can find them on Pine Creek Doug's channel. He's had at least two. All I'm trying to point out, Doug, is that that's going to ultimately serve you. That's going to serve you. That is not... Like, you know, don't listen to any, any atheist who say, you didn't, you didn't wreck him, you didn't, you didn't get anywhere. You got a lot more of wherever it is you want to go doing those type of conversations than you do when you j just try to, de you know, play whatever your little routines are. Honest conversations is, is actually the nub of it. You start getting honest conversations, then you're going to, if you really, then if you really think that there's a delusion at root here, then you got to figure out what is the root of that delusion. What is the actual emotional connection? What's the hook that's drawing everybody? Now, I told you plainly in my life what I was looking for is peace of mind. It's exactly what I found at that church. And it's exactly what I found in my religious experiences prior since. Almost total and complete peace of mind. And that was what I, what I wanted more than anything else. Um, and that's, you know, when I was talking to my cousin, that's one of the takeaways. I was like, there's something real here. There's some sort of power available to her that I want in my life. Whether I thought that was the actual living God or not, I can't say. But if there was something about it. I got this strong sense of like, you know, this is, this is calm and order and safety and tranquility. And this is what I want. Sanctuary. There's something in this that I really, really, truly want. And it's there and it can be found. Now, if your experience of religion is poison and it's toxin, you didn't have that. Okay, my cousin's pretty cool. If she weren't cool, I wouldn't have experienced that. And we were having one of those late night conversations over alcohol. You know, so that has a lot to do with it too. Uh, let me see if I'm running out of time. Anyways, the long and the short of it is 17, yeah, I'm doing right. Um, you know, those are the type of conversations you want to be having, Doug. I, apl I thoroughly applaud those conversations, and that's what you should be doing all the time. Even if your agenda remains to, you know, prove to the Christians that what they believe is predicated on lies and it's all fantasy. You are going to be a lot more successful at doing that if you have some sort of understanding of what the actual emotional hook is. And the only way you can ever actually get at that, human beings are extraordinarily complicated is to have real, honest, penetrating conversations that take place over, you know, a p period of an hour or so where you put any agenda on hold. If you have an agenda, it's not an honest conversation. If you're steering it somewhere, it's not an honest conversation. If it's spontaneous and you are responding to what people are saying and going, that's interesting, then it's an on honest conversation. You guys got it a lot with, with Stuart, you know. A lot of stuff that was talked about you even brought up something that I, I what, what did you say about marriages? If you, if you could find a practical, that I agree with. If you could find a practical angle for Christianity, like if you could give me a reason how Christianity is going to help my marriage or help me on a pragmatic, practical, down-to-earth level, you know, that's, I totally agree with that. And I think that's insightful. You know, a lot of what Christians are trying to sell and that's only here in apologetics land. Out there in the real world where Christians are trying to move product and sell books and stuff, most of what they're trying to sell isn't, you know, here's answers to the Old Testament. Here's, here's logical reasons for believing in God. They're trying to sell, you know, here's pragmatic answers in the real, real world. Mostly what they're trying to sell is, you know, God's going to help you financially. Um, but what you were talking about was something a little bit deeper and more real than that. You know, can God make you, practically speaking, a better person. For my own self, I, f I find that that's what's happened. If you practice a form of intrinsic religiosity, wherein you actually try to practice what you preach, and you internalize the scriptures, the positive scriptures, not the ones that everyone's all conflicted about, but the ones that any idiot could tell you, yeah, that'd be a really good approach to life. See, like, in your marriage, and you have, like, you know, love is patient, kind, long-suffering, willing to suffer wrong, 
and you internalize the religious teaching to the point where you actually become, try to internalize that and become willing to suffer wrong, be more patient, kind, and long-suffering with your wife, and sow love and kindness into your marriage. Now that's something that was actually being taught at my church way back in the beginning when I was a Christian. And that dramatically helped. You know, dramatically helped. My wife and I have a really pretty good marriage now. But once upon a time, it was really difficult. And that approach, you know, of sowing love and compassion and mercy into your, into your marriage dramatically helped in a practical terms. It's a kind of spiritual thing. But, you know. So there are those, those answers, too. They, as a general rule, don't get brought up here in the realm of, you know, apologetics, debating atheists and things like that, because that's not what most, that's just not how the culture out here is. It's more, you know, logical arguments and, and such and such. But back there, back, back in the real world, nobody gives the flyingest fig about most of the stuff we talk about. Nobody cares at all. If I go to my church today, and I'm putting this out in the videos, it remains true. If I go to my church today and talk about, like, guys, what do you think about God's treatment of the Amalekites? People be like, look at me like I had two heads. They have no idea what I was talking about. What do you think about God commanding a genocide? <laughs> they have no idea what I was talking about. None. None. What about that scripture where you smashed the head against the stones? They would have no idea what I was talking about. That stuff that atheists have sought out. And they've made those stump, they've basically, you know, not necessarily, they've made those stumbling blocks more real than they are in the actual real world where people attend church. Most of the stuff that we debate here, most people in most churches don't even know is in the Bible. Nor do they care, that's the important part, they don't care. They don't care, they want, they want Christianity for practical reasons, raising their family right. You know, there's a whole series of emotional reasons that are important to them, that are actual bread and butter of where people live and breathe, and why they actually care about what they believe. And those are, those are not arrived at by, you know, logical type of argumentation, things like that. Those take some wisdom and insight to ferret out, but the, ultimately they're a lot more important. So, I think that made sense. Yeah, I'm rambling a little, but I'm pretty sure that made sense. Kind of, eh, maybe, sort of. There's, uh, you know, the only way that you could find out what is really motivating people to be religious. Really, truly assuming that, we're, that the ontology isn't there. I'm just taking it from your point of view that, there, you know, there isn't an actual living God who's prompting these religious experiences. I'm taking it from your point of view. The only way you can actually get at the real, true motivational core is by having honest conversations and feeling people out. That's it. It's the only way you really learn what time it is. Why? Because people don't actually even know, Doug. They don't. They don't know. You, got, you have an honest conversation, you go deeper into something, you will find out things about people that they don't know about themselves. That's something that people used to tell me all the time. Every, every week, somebody would tell me, you know me better than, you know, than I know myself. And it was always true. Why? Because people don't know themselves all that well. When you ask them what the real reason why they're a Christian, they're going to give you an answer that they, that they think they should give you. But it's usually not the right answer. They aren't in the business of introspection. So if you want to become really good at deconverting whole swaths of humanity, you've got to know what that hook actually is. And that hook is hidden from view and it's hard to get at. It's not something you can just kind of know something you have to really interact with people and really try and feel them out to understand. Um, I think that was clear. You know, that's what I meant. If, if there were atheists at college, every other clique out there I've interacted with to, to, you know, till three in the morning with just about every other type of person you could imagine. Never did it with atheists. Why? Because there weren't any when I was at college. They weren't there. They didn't come on the scene as a, like a popular movement that, that has some type of, you know, real world appeal till... The 2000s. I don't even think it was before. I don't even think it was in the late 90s. It wasn't until sometime in the last 15 years or so. Uh, if there were atheists, I would, have, I would have a lot better insight into them. So, there you have it. Yeah, rambling a little, but, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what I said was insightful. I really, really, really strongly approve of the new and improved Pine Creek Dove. If you can have all honest conversations from now on. I mean, not, you know, all honest conversations can't find this taller. But you had two. And those two were really good. And I may, I may actually bring them up again. I might go into them again. 
There's a lot to be learned from those type of conversations. That's really where it's at. That's really ultimately where it's at. So, bravo. Bravo, Pine Creek Doug. And, you know, Pine Creek Doug and I are also on the same side when it came to censorship. Yeah, you know, it was like, him and I were on, this, on the side of not censoring. So, yeah, who knows? Maybe he's turning over a whole new leaf. He'll become an ally in the cause, in the cause for justice and rightness and goodness and holiness. So, there you have it, kids. That's all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.